So, we humans often like to think of ourselves as, as unique, as uniquely unique, as special, as somehow being on a higher plane than all, than all the rest of the creatures with which we share the planet. We like to make long lists of all the traits that set us apart from other animals, such as uh, tool use, language, theory of mind, self-awareness, art, music, um, the list goes on. But the more we've actually studied our animal relatives, the more we've found that the differences are not so extreme as we thought. In fact, uh, animals have shown themselves capable of um, carrying out all of the, um, the, the items that I just listed in some form or another. But there's, uh, I actually like to call this way of thinking that we humans are so unique as human exceptionalism. And even though a lot of scientists have, uh, scientists have acknowledged that uh, other animals are capable of doing a lot of the things we once thought were unique to us, there's one, there's one trait that we still often hold out as being absolutely uniquely human, the last sort of barricade between ourselves and other animals, and that is culture. Um, what is culture? Culture, for the sake of this talk, I'm going to define as socially transmitted behavior that varies between populations. Of course, with the humans, we're uh, you know, familiar with all the different ways in which we differ from each other, from pierogies to Big Macs to um, uh, sushi, you know, across the board, uh, not only with food, but with the way we build our houses, our languages, and uh, the way we dress. But um, how, how, how big a divide is this between ourselves and the rest of, of creation? Are we the only cultural animal? The, the sort of uh, cultural uniqueness camp um, that, that basically says, we humans stand out from other animals. They, they would point to things such as the city of Kyoto in the background here. We humans are building cities, are um, making uh, spaceships, uh, creating the internet, whereas the Japanese macaque here sitting in the foreground is just kind of going on and doing the same kind of thing that it has for generations upon generations with little or no innovation or invention. But I want to call into question this, this division. And today we're going to look for signs of culture in other animals. We could look in a lot of different places. For instance, scientists have found signs of culture in whales, in songbirds. But let's look a little closer to home, to our closest relatives, uh, together with, chimpa uh, with bonobos, the chimpanzee. Chimpanzees are great apes. They live in Africa. They share 98.76% of their DNA with us. They live in complex societies. They make, make and use tools. So if we're going to find signs of culture in another animal, why don't we have a look at, at, these, at these animals? Uh, we know that chimpanzees are indeed really good at um, uh, learning from other individuals socially, and sometimes even learning from humans. This uh, orphan chimpanzee, Kisanola, we rescued from the bushmeat trade in Africa. He spent hours studying very carefully what um, our mechanic here, Seba, was doing to fix the motorbike. And then a few days later, he picked up a stick tool, you can see that in his hand there, and had to go at fixing it himself. We know from the laboratory uh, that chimpanzees are capable of spreading tr uh, cultural traditions from one group to the other. And in fact, in the last 55 years of field study in the forests of Africa, scientists have come up with a number of different uh, chimpanzee cultural traditions, which I would actually like to uh, term here as chimpanzee cultural realms. Um, and for instance, one of them is in West Africa, where chimpanzees have entered the Stone Age. Uh, the, the chimps there will uh, take rocks and put nuts on an anvil and crack open the rocks, just like our, our ancestors did. Uh, and we know this tradition goes back at least 4,000 years, based on archaeological evidence. Now, what's interesting is there are stones and there's rocks, uh, there's stones and there's nuts uh, all across Africa, and yet it's only in this limited geographical area that the chimpanzees have been seen to do this. Now, uh, in, in Central Africa, you actually have three different uh, traditions that seem to be, uh, have been invented and spread through the forests there. One of them is the honey club uh, tool use technique, where the chimpanzees basically take big uh, wooden clubs and pound into arboreal beehives to get the tasty honey. This is only seen there, even though bees are found all over Africa. In addition, they uh, use uh, sticks to fish for termites, and they put a little special brush on the end of the stick, which makes, makes it better at collecting more termites. 
And finally, they use uh, uh, tool sets, four different kinds of tool sets. What are tool sets? Tool sets are basically a series of tools used in a sequence in order to achieve a certain uh, end. And this is only found there. Uh, casting the net a little wider, we have the uh, honey digging uh, tool technology. And actually, I've just brought this honey digging tool, these two tools right here, back from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I was a few months ago. A chimpanzee was using this to dig up underground honey. Um, and you can see the chimps actually modified this stick. They ripped the ends off, and they ripped the leafy branches off to make it a better digging stick. And then they dug into the ground to, to acquire underground honey. Now, once again, honey is found all over Africa, but only chimpanzees in this region are known to do that. And finally, there's one more um, tradition, uh, set of traditions in Uganda, which I call the no-stick culture. Uh, a lot of Ugandan chimpanzee populations don't use sticks at all to acquire honey or other insects. Instead, they, they'll use uh, leaves to mop up water and, and other fluids. Um, now, well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, we could also study chimpanzee gestural uh, culture because chimpanzees use gestures to communicate with one another. But because the chimpanzees I'm studying in this study, we, uh, we're not actually able to watch their behavior, we just can find their artifacts, we're going to limit it to basically their material culture, their tool use. Now, one thing we know about uh, human culture is it's an enormous diversity. Um, not only with the tools we use and the houses we build, but the things that we actually find tasty, our, our, our food preferences. Insects, of course, are found all over the world. We could all eat them if we wanted to. But it's only in certain societies that insects are seen as tasty. Here my friend Olivier is showing us how delicious uh, are uh, palm nut grubs. Now a closer look, I don't know if you guys are feeling a little queasy like I am looking at this. Um, but any of us could be eating these things, but only certain, certain human groups do. Before we get too judgmental, this is actually a big delicacy where I'm from in North Carolina, which is uh, pig brains. You can buy them in the grocery store in little cans like this. We mix them with scrambled eggs. Before I was a vegan, I used to eat a lot of this. So uh, pigs are all over the world, but not everybody would look at this and think, mmm. Um, so people who um, believe in a sort of human cultural uniqueness, um, they would actually say that this is one thing that really is peculiar about human culture that other animal species don't seem to have. In fact, it's been uh, referred to as cultural override. And that, that actually uh, means we're sort of limited in our behaviors by what we've learned is okay to eat from our parents. And um, the critics of chimpanzee culture would basically say chimpanzees, unlike humans, they're, they're just basically responding to what's available around them. For instance, all chimpanzees kind of inherently know how to crack open nuts or to uh, use sticks to dig up uh, ants or honey. But basically, if there's a lot of ants around, that's going to pull that behavior out of them. Or if there's a lot of nuts around, that's going to pull the, the, the nut cracking behavior out of them. They're sort of passive in that, in that way of looking at it. But are chimpanzees really this way? Or do they also have cultural override? There's a, a Dr. Thibaut Gruber actually um, ha has posited that chimpanzees also have this trait. Well, we're going to actually look and see in northern Congo. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to study. Oh, uh, and just another example of cultural override before we get to the, the chimps. Uh, a good example of it is, imagine an American living in China and being surrounded by chopsticks, but going out of their way to find a fork. That's cultural override right there in a nutshell. Um, so with chimpanzees, uh, we're lucky enough to be able to study this um, hitherto unknown population of chimpanzees living in the forest of northern DR Congo. These are the famous Beely apes. About 15 years ago, we didn't know what the heck they were. We thought, this is an adult male peering at me uh, uh, from the treetops. We thought maybe they were a hybrid between chimpanzees and gorillas, or maybe a new species of great ape. Turns out they're chimpanzees. But the great thing about them is they're part of the largest continuous population of chimpanzees left in the world. And so it's a great place to study the spread of po potential culture. Okay, to get there is, is quite, a, quite a trek. Uh, the t we, we fly into the town of Beely, in this case in a missionary plane, on a really rough-hewn airstrip. Um, it is one of the remote, most remote places in the world. And one of the great things about working in these places is you get to meet the local human cultures. These are the Azande people, and they were just as curious about me as I was about them, as you can see from this young woman and her baby. The Azande have an extremely light ecological footprint. Uh, they're slash and burn agriculturalists, but basically, because they have such a light ecological footprint, that's why there's so much wildlife left in this region. Um, 
so I want you to take a look at this map. It's a very diverse habitat here. The green uh, colors represent forest. The purple represents savanna. The lighter areas represent where humans are active. So this is a road, and this is the town of Bealey. We initially set our camp up 10 kilometers west of the road in a place called Camp Louie. Um, and what we did was, with the help of uh, these incredible tra local trackers here, Legada and Bolivier, we would follow the chimpanzees every morning. We would listen for their pant hoots, which is sort of a wake-up call the chimpanzees do. So we would hear that, and we'd rush out of our tents and run and try and find these chimpanzees. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't working. When we would run into the chimps, they would actually scream and jump out of the trees and run off in terror. Why? Well, unfortunately, across Africa these days, there's a, the chimpanzees are under serious threat from the commercial bushmeat trade where basically chimpanzee meat and also babies are sold in markets, like this little baby here in the town of Buta, a couple of hundred kilometers south. It's being sold as a pet. Its mother was just killed uh, probably a few, uh, a few weeks earlier. Um, in, in the Bealey area, this is one of the, a chimpanzee hunter wearing his traditional mask, hunting with a uh, traditional, uh, uh, actually Portuguese-style crossbow with a poison-tipped arrow. In the Bealey area, chimpanzees have been hunted. It's, it's actually not reached uh, the commercial level yet, which is actually why there's so many chimpanzees still. But there's a good reason they're scared of us. So we kind of gave up our efforts to um, habituate to our presence the chimpanzees living near the road. But this wily tracker Legata here, he used to go on a sort of walkabouts with his family in, these deep, in this deep forest called Gangu. And he told me that out there in this remote forest, three-day walk west of the road, it was full of elephant trails. It was full of wildlife. And the chimpanzees, he said, were so unafraid of humans, they would approach, us, they would approach him on the ground and look, and look through his backpack. So I had, to see if, I had to see this. And so we actually set out on this uh, long journey out into the forest, into the Gangu forest. And then we set up... Uh, okay, to get there was actually uh, quite a trek. Uh, we had to cross these baking hot savannas. And then we had to slog through these deep swamps. And when we'd, uh, we'd wake up in the morning, we'd find our shoes covered in these uh, honeybees, which, uh, you know, imagine trying to put these on. Not fun. But it was really worth it. We put camera traps out there later and caught on film all these amazing animals. It was just as Legata had said. Uh, and by the way, in the eight months the camera traps were out, we got not a single film of humans in that forest, which to find such a place is almost unknown these days. Uh, leopards. And then here comes a species that is normally found only in the savannas, but we found it deep in the forest as well, hyenas, full cast of pre big predators. And yes, a chimpanzee, uh, actually tons of chimpanzees, and they were extremely curious about us, just as Legata said. They would approach us and peer at us uh, as if we were just some odd species of primate that they hadn't seen before. We were lucky enough to capture on film this footage of an adult female chimpanzee you can see she's arriving at this scene with a tool already made in her mouth. Uh, there's a little baby on her back. You'll notice the baby's going to watch carefully what she's doing. And what she's doing is she's dipping her tool into uh, insects and then feeding on them. And what's really cool is you're going to see another younger female following her that the camera trap picked up. Uh, this is her. And she does exactly what the older female did, probably her mother. So you can see this is how chimpanzees learn to use tools. They follow in the footsteps of their, their elders. Um, after this, uh, we actually expanded the scope of our survey um, to a 50,000 square kilometer region, uh, covering an enormous area in northern Congo, on both sides of a major river called the Awele. Uh, you can see here the yellow represents where we walked, the red represents chimpanzee nests. They make nests every night, and that's how you know how many there are. Uh, uh, chimpanzee nests. So we found them everywhere we looked. This is a large and continuous population. And we actually, um, we were expecting on either side of this river, there's very different habitat. The purple represents savanna. So there's a lot of savanna up here in the Bealey area where we were first. Down here to the south of the Welly is, is just green forest. So we were actually expecting, based on what we know about chimpanzees elsewhere, to find very different chimpanzee traditions. That's not what we found. To the north of the Oweli, um, we found a lot of these ground nests. Now, normally, chimpanzees across Africa sleep in the treetops. Why? Because they're small-bodied and they're pretty scared of things like leopards and lions, which are at Bili, by the way. Gorillas are famous for making a lot of their nests on the ground. Well, one-fifth or so 
of the nests we found in, in the uh, north of the Oweli River were ground nests. And then to the south of the Oweli, we found the exact same thing. About a fifth of the nests were ground nests, made in the exact same way as to the north. There's only one predator that actually shuts down this ground nest behavior. You might be able to guess which one it is. It's actually us. Anywhere where humans are found, uh, are, are hunting and setting traps, the chimpanzees start sleeping up in the trees. The chimpanzees also, uh, across this area, have a very subtle stick tool tradition. This is one of them. These are the honey digging sticks I told you about, which are included in here. But the chimps also make these extremely long, uh, up to 2.5 meter tall tools. This, this fellow, Jeroen Swinkels, is actually two meters tall, so you can see how huge they are. They're the biggest yet in Africa. And they use them to uh, 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 hunt for driver ants. Driver ants are these uh, sort of thing out of a horror movie. They're these ants that swarm across the, the floor of the forest, um, and sometimes they'll invade your tent, and that's not a nice way to wake up in the night. But the chimpanzees will actually go up to their, their homes, these big mounds, and thrust these giant sticks into the mounds. The ants swarm up them, and then they scoop them off and eat them. And they use uh, sticks for another three species of insects as well. And this I found extremely interesting. These mounds here belong to a, a, a species of termite called Macrotermes. They're found all over Africa. And in, in a lot of other sites where chimpanzees have been studied, uh, including where Jane Goodall first studied chimpanzees in Gombe, Tanzania, the chimpanzees use tools, something like this, to fish for these, uh, uh, these termites. Well, we looked at hundreds of these mounds and never found a single tool near them. The macrotermies were not found in their dung. The chimpanzees, for some reason here, seem to be completely ignoring this potentially great food resource. Um, at the same time, they have chosen a completely different kind of termite. These two species called, sorry for the long names here, but Thoracotermes and Cubitermes. They form a mushroom-shaped mounds on the ground, or sometimes football-shaped mounds, and the chimpanzees don't use any tools to eat them at all. They rip them off, they walk over bipedally to a root, and they pound the, the, the thing open on the root, like has happened here, and they apparently eat the wiggling termites and larvae out of there. Now, these termites are also found all over Africa, but everywhere chimpanzees completely ignore them, except with one exception in the Thai, Thai forest. But, um, but here, across this 50,000 square kilometer region, the chimpanzees love these things. They also pound open fruits. Um, hmm. Uh, African giant snails, and apparently also tortoises. So they have a kind of a pounding culture. They don't use uh, hammers at all, but they just pound things open without using tools. Um, now, they also have a, a really unique sort of prey preference. Uh, chimpanzees across Africa are known to prey on uh, uh, monkeys, especially red colobus monkeys. They sometimes even hunt on them cooperatively. Uh, we don't have any evidence that these chimpanzees do that, but what they do eat is these uh, tree pangolins. They're sort of like uh, scaly walking pine combs. And uh, you can see, I put powder in this footprint here to show you who the culprit is of who ate this poor pangolin. And believe it or not, they seem to eat leopards. Uh, trusty tracker Legata here, who is really an excellent observer in the forest, actually witnessed a chimpanzee tearing into a leopard carcass, and uh, he brought the paw back as evidence. Okay, so based on this traits, ground nesting, uh, these five kinds of tools, uh, pounding open termite mounds, uh, I'm actually going to propose that a, the addition of a new chimpanzee cultural realm to the repertoire, and that is the Bili cultural realm. And it's, as you can see, it appears to be spread over an enormous area. There's tentative evidence that it goes all the way to the west border of Uganda, although we have to confirm that. So this would be one of the largest, uh, largest that we have so far. Now, how does this relate to cultural override? Um, are chimpanzees just merely responding to the abundance of insects at a certain area, and it's just pulling these behaviors out of them? This, was, this map t will tell you no. So I, w I want you to see, these, these maps are basically of the same, this is the same map of, of our entire study region. And on this side of the map, you see uh, availability of driver ants at 12 sites. You see where these dots are? Um, so we have numbers of driver ants that chimpanzees could eat at these 12 sites. The bigger the circle, the more the ants. On this side, same map, but here you have the, the number of tools we found to prey on these driver ants. Now, if chimps are just basically responding to the abundance of driver ants and eating whatever's around them, you would expect, um, this makes it a little more clear, I think, uh, you would expect for these two maps to overlap. In other words, in an area, for instance, where there's a lot of driver ants, you'd expect to see a lot of tools. But as you see, that's not the case at all. They don't overlap at all. There's no relationship between availability of these insects 
and the likelihood that chimpanzees prey on them. Maybe this is just a fluky uh, thing involving driver ants. Maybe it, it, you know, it's just kind of an accident. Well, we also find the same thing with a whole other kind of ant called pachycondyla. Same thing, you can see a lot of pachycondyla here and almost no tools used to eat them here. And the maps, again, do not match up. So I think this is consistent with cultural override. The chimpanzees are bringing their own food preferences to what they find around them. And that's very much like what we do. So once again, chimpanzees have surprised us by doing things that we used, we used to think were uniquely human. And once again, undermining uh, human exceptionalism. Thank you very much.